Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Great to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you so much for your uh, sowing into the kingdom of God. We're going to have a great week, aren't we? And uh, I know the Lord's going to do some great things. If you know people that need miracles, get them here tonight, all right? Because I, I don't know, you know, uh, we, we said Jesus is here, but, you know, he might be other places too, but we brought him with us here, amen? So where he is, something good's going to happen, praise God. Amen. I, I'm just so glad to be here today. Appreciate uh, the opportunity. We love this church. We call this our family. So uh, if you don't like me, well, I'm that one, you know, in the family. You know, sometimes uh, uh, if you don't know who that is, the one they're all, you know, you, you say something about your family and, and uh, you're the, going, I don't know anybody in the family like that. You're the one they're talking about. So, praise God. Amen. Well, why don't you stand with me today? Hallelujah. Yeah, get on uh, social media today. Tell people about the services this week and uh, bring people. You know, they'll come for something special. And uh, we have people that have needs and, and have troubles. Uh, bring them out. All right. I brought my lunch. All right. I'm going to preach a long time this morning. If I get hungry, I got it, all right? But uh, not really. I'm, I'm not really, uh, you know I don't go too long, all right? There's other guys that go a lot longer than me, so be relax, okay? I'm, I'm going to not be in that group. But let's look at some verses this morning. Real quickly, we're going to just uh, uh, blow through these. Some of the scripture we're going to go through pretty fast, so uh, not because it's not important, but because... Uh, I want to get done on a timely manner, but you might write some of these down and look at them later, all right? Acts 2, 17 and 18, it says, It shall come to pass in the last days. Everybody say, in the last days. Says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. 2 Timothy 3 and 1, all right? This know also that in the last days, say it, perilous times shall come. Now we're going to look over to 2 Peter 3 and 3. The Word of God says, Knowing this first, that there shall come scoffers walking after their own lust. 1 John 2.18. 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last time. Everybody say, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that this is the last time. Everybody say last time. All right, one more verse. Jude uh, chapter 1, and we read there, How that they told you that there should be mockers who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. Let's pray over the reading of the word this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word. Again, may the word of God forcefully penetrate every heart that is here. Lord, I pray that you'll give up strength uh, that I may speak as if you're speaking and minister as if you are ministering. And Lord, I, I pray that every barrier will be broken today in the name of the Lord Jesus. We declare that the atmosphere here is charged with the very presence of God, the very anointing of God. Every yoke shall be destroyed in the name of Jesus and we believe today Lord that you're taking us up higher we glorify you we magnify you we exalt you in Jesus mighty name and everybody said you may be seated this morning uh, when we read about the last time we read about the last days how many know there's going to be some stuff happening in the last days and in the last time we are living in those days where there will be mockers, there will be scoffers, uh, uh, there will be also uh, those that we call antichrist, and then we also know that there will be Holy Ghost outpouring in these last days. So I believe uh, that we have an opportunity to do something. There's going to be some stuff happening when you live in perilous times or times of stress. And we need to make the most of the time that we have. Uh, 
Uh, if you watched football yesterday afternoon, I'm sure that there was somebody at the end of the game that was trying to make the most of the time they had. When you get to the end of the game, that's when the games get interesting. That's when uh, people begin to do everything they can. And I believe we are not living a game here, but we are living in the last time, the last days, and we hear all these things that are happening in the world. Some of them are lies. Some of them are speculations, and some of them are truths. But uh, I want to name a few of these things that we hear happening in the world today and what it will happen in the last days. We hear things like the stock market is on a bubble and it will crash. We hear about global warming. We hear about global unrest. And in this country and around the world, we are more divided politically than ever before. We know about false prophets. Uh, a week uh, ago and a day, David Mead said Jesus was coming back well I uh, guess what he did not come back uh, but he could come at any moment David Mead is a false prophet I don't know why we just don't talk about it and just say it but there will be false prophets we know about a North Korean leader that has a crazy haircut but not only does he have a crazy haircut he's crazy We hear things like nuclear war is imminent. We know uh, uh, I had a uh, man that owned a restaurant up in New York. He was talking about all the food shortages because of storms and the different things that happen. But uh, uh, I don't know if we're having any, but it's good news for the farmer that has some food. Prices go up. This is called America, all right? Do you, you understand how things work here? So for some it's bad news, for others it's good news. But uh, if we run out of food, I brought some with me today. So, somebody brought me some nabs. We can make this. These will last clear through the tribulation. Potted meat. I went to this pig pulling thing, all right? I didn't even know what a pig pull was, all right? I had no idea what that meant, okay? What? Pig picking, okay. I didn't even know where I was at. I got the I got the address sent to me, and I thought since it said Elizabeth City, you know, it'd be like a minute or two from my hotel. Little did I know that out in the middle of nowhere, it's still Elizabeth City. And they were talking about potted meat. I, you know, and I, let's see what the ingredients are. Number one, it's mechanically separated. So that means it wasn't at the pig pulling picking. It looks like the ingredients are whatever we don't put in bad hot dogs, we put in this can. But if there's a food shortage, there'll be plenty of potted meat. Okay. That's the good news, I guess. The good news, but really, seriously, we hear of wars and rumors of wars in these days that we live. We know there's terrorism on every hand. Uh, we know about the storms that have hit in uh, this nation. Uh, we know about what happened in Puerto Rico. We know there are distress of nations. We know that we live in fierce days, furious days, dangerous days, difficult days, and we know that there is a hostility in the world toward this book right here and Bible-believing Christians. We know that uh, there is an exponential increase of devilish power, and we know that there are seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in the world today. I understood a seminary is now teaching that you can have the kingdom without the king, but I will tell you that a gospel that denies the imminent return of Jesus Christ is not the gospel at all. I know that Jesus is coming soon. I, uh, according to this 
word, there is a broad way that leads to destruction, but there is a narrow way that still leads to life. And if I don't preach broad enough for you, I'm not uh, uh, doing that for any reason but to get you to the way of life. Amen? Now, I know that uh, with all these things that are going on, the question is, how should we live? How are we going to live uh, until the promised trumpet sounds and Jesus comes back and takes us up higher? How am I to live in a world that I am to be in, but I'm not to be of it? How am I to live in the world in these last days or these days that we call last times? Let's just see what the Word of God says about these days that we live. Matthew 24, and I'm going to skip a little bit in it, but it says, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The last verse says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. If you go over into the book of Luke, chapter 17, talking about these last days, these last times. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So the days that we are living, we could describe them as the days of Noah, the days of Lot, we could talk uh, about this day that we're living in uh, as being last days, last time, and the Bible gives us a very clear picture of what end time society will look like and what end time culture will be like. The Bible's very clear about it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, the Word of God says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jans and Jambres uh, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. This is what end times culture will be like. This is what end times society will be like. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Again, talking about the last times, the last days. Amos 8 talks about it. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Thank God you don't have to have that in Elizabeth City. Thank God from this pulpit, the Word of God still is being declared without compromise. But it says in the last days, uh, there'll be a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water. I think if we got to tell people about what's going on in this church, more people would come and they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not Find it. So I'm asking again with all that is happening, with what the Bible prophesies about in the last days, the last time, how should we live in this world today? With all that we are facing in this prophetic hour, do we live in fear? We could live in fear. We could say, man, this is a terrible place to raise children. Uh, this is a bad place. I was with some people and they said, Every, all the kids are terrible. I said, that's a lie. Maybe your kids are, but all the kids are not. Not all the young people are going to the dogs in the last days. The Word of God says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We said it again. I'm going to keep saying it. And God has not given us a spirit of fear. So I'm asking you, how are you living? Listen, God has not given us a spirit of fear. And whatever is of fear. Fear is not a faith. So, how are you living? Faith is what pleases God. So, I cannot live in fear and please God. Jesus still delivers us from all fear and is in the house. We sang it. Come on into the house because Jesus delivers from fear in the house. Now, God has not appointed us to wrath. 
so we can live in these last days and, and know that God's not angry. I don't know who you want to blame the storms on that have hit Houston and hit Florida and, and hit uh, uh, Puerto Rico and hit uh, our country. You can blame it on whoever you want, but I'm going to go to the Word of God. The Word of God says, The thief cometh not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and more abundantly. I don't want to blame my God for what he did not do I don't know what kind of father you have but my father is not a, a child beater are you understanding me I serve a good God today amen do you believe it God's good you know, we say all the time, but is he really all the time? you got to rethink some things. You need to renew your mind because I will tell you, the Word of God is what renews our mind, but you're not going to renew your mind watching Geraldo. You're not going to renew your mind watching Oprah. You're not going to renew your mind watching Jerry Springer, but you renew your mind with the Word of God, and the Word of God will change things. The word says God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So how am I going to live? Am I going to hole up somewhere and, and be afraid for my children and, and uh, possibly grandchildren someday? Am I going to uh, live uh, uh, afraid? I believe that we are told to occupy till he comes. I'm not to sit back and do nothing, but I'm supposed to be busy in the Lord's work. You need to get to the foyer after church and sign up to be a part of Harvest Fest. That's the word of the Lord. He said, occupy till I come. There's somebody that you need, you need to be an agent of hope to. They're going to bring their little witch, and they're going to bring their little goblin, and they're going to bring their little kids that, that have no uh, idea about the love of Jesus Christ, and you are going to be an agent to hope to them and be somebody that changes their life. Come on now. You cannot occupy till he comes living in fear. That's why so many people, the only church they have is on the Internet. I live in fear. I don't want to get germs. I don't want to be around people. I don't want to. I'm going to tell you something. That is not the will of God. Watch the thing on TV when you got issues and problems and, and you're shut in. But I'm going to tell you, God wants you to be around other godly people. God wants you to occupy. And together we can do more. There's something about the power uh, of somebody getting together. I can put a thousand to flight, but two can put ten thousand to flight. We have got to do something, and we got a work to do, and we cannot do it by ourselves. There's a concept in the Bible that has been a blessing to me since I began preaching 35 years ago. And it's a concept uh, that as I walk through the Bible, it always uh, puts me in the right perspective. And that is simply this. In Rome, uh, Hebrews 8, 6, not Romans, but Hebrews 8, 6. It says, but now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. That's talking about Jesus. He's the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Now what does that mean to me? That means this whole Bible from cover to cover is blessed by God, it was written uh, uh, by men that, that were inspired by the Holy Ghost, so every word from front to back is good for me. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes we read the Old Testament and we realize times have changed a little bit and we sometimes go, well, you know, that was for God's people then. But I'm going to tell you, I read in Hebrews uh, chapter 8 and verse 6, I have a better covenant established upon better promises. If I find it in the Old Testament, I'm going to tell you, I believe if he did it for the children of God then, he can do it for me now. If he delivered the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, he can get me out of the trouble that I'm in today. If uh, in the middle of uh, uh, all that was going on in society, Daniel, he got in trouble because he prayed uh, uh, in the, uh, three times a day, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what they tell me I can't do, but I know that my God is able to shut the mouth of the lion today are you with me so what am I saying 
If I find a promise in the Old Testament, a pattern in the Old Testament, I know that if he did it then, because of the cross of Calvary, I can expect God to do the same or better for me. If Abraham was blessed in all ways, me being a child of Abraham, I can be blessed in all ways. I can be blessed coming in, and I can be blessed going out. I can be the head and not the tail and above and not beneath. I don't know what the world is telling you, but I'm going to stick with the Word of God. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can say it's to our advantage. We have a better covenant established upon better promises. Now, with all that said, we live in a very unique prophetic hour. We live in the last days, the last time. And the Word of God gives us this model that will help us and bless us in the last days, the last time. I want you to see how we are to react and live in the days that we are in. Go to Genesis chapter 45, verse 10 and 11. Genesis chapter 45. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me. Thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast, and there will I nourish thee. I like that right there. He didn't say, I'm going to give you potted meat. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Now let's explain this out a little bit. He said, leave that up on the screen. But he said, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. He's talking to the children of Israel. He's talking to the people of God. And something has happened previous to this. We know about a young man, 17 years old, by the name of Joseph, that had a beautiful coat. All right? The coat, we know, was a, col a colorful coat. We know that it made his brothers jealous, but that wasn't even all. Uh, uh, he had a dream. And that dream, sometimes you've got to watch who you tell your dreams to. He had a dream... And the dream that he had was that there would be seven years of famine, but preceding the seven years of famine, there would be seven years of plenty. And the seven years of, of plenty, they were to store up for the time of famine. And then he has this dream that even, the whole world would come and bow to him, even his brothers. Well, they were ticked off. And the Bible talks about Joseph... They were going to kill him. Then they pretended he died and put blood on that coat. and They sold him to the traders that came by. Eventually he became a, a head of Potiphar's house. He became a powerful man. And then Potiphar's wife, we know he's just a young man, but she uh, lied about him and, and we know that it, he was put into prison. So all this is happening. Things are going bad in his life, it looks like, but all the time uh, something's going on behind the scenes. God had a place called Goshen. Now listen, they've already, at the time of this scripture, there's already been two years of famine. Famine is when there is no planting, there's no reaping, there's no harvest, all right? There's no rain, nothing is happening. Two years, the whole world is coming to Egypt because of the dream uh, that uh, this young man Joseph had. They had prepared for the future. And so the whole world is coming to Egypt to get their food. They're buying from Egypt. And so the brothers of Joseph wind up coming to Egypt because they don't have enough. Their dad sent them there because they need food. And they hear that Egypt has food. They get there. They do not recognize their brother. Finally, understand, they've had no reaping, no harvest. The world's there buying food. God's people are in the famine. All right? But Joseph had a dream. I love it. He saw what was coming. He prepared for it. Now, Goshen, let's go there. I'm going to speak about this. This is out of Smith's Bible Dictionary. The name of the part of Egypt where the Israelites dwelt during the whole period of their temporary stay in that country. 
It was a pasture land, especially suited to a shepherd people and sufficient for the Israelites who there prospered and were separate from the main body of the Egyptians. Now, these young, the sons, the brothers of Jake, uh, uh, of Joseph, they come and they're at, wanting to buy but he begins to get a word from God. God talks about, I'm going to give you a place called Goshen. They are to come and live amongst the Egyptians. Now, there's a spiritual reality where true believers, I believe, are exempt from the famine of end times. Goshen, that word again, it's there. It means a drawing near and approaching. Now, in this place called Goshen, the people of Israel lived there and they were provided for and they prospered even in the middle of famine. God had a place of safety and protection and prosperity and comfort for them. Now listen, there's a spiritual reality where true believers are exempt from the famine of end times. I don't know what's coming down the pike for the world. I'm going to tell you, I don't know what, I don't like what I hear. I don't like all the stuff that I see. But I will tell you what I believe, that if God did it for the Israelites, then he can do something for me. I'm trying to make this as easy as I can. It's not a fantasy land, and it's not even a geographic location, but today I believe it's an atmosphere where the presence of the Almighty God uh, creates an environment where believers are supremely blessed, even if there's famine everywhere around. A place of safety, comfort, prosperity. It's a place of refuge from end-time storms, an oasis in the desert of destruction. Spare. Joseph, he realizes when his brothers come, he said what the devil meant for bad. I don't know what's happening around, but I hear uh, today I was looking uh, on uh, uh, Facebook and one of the men we worked with, we took a team down to Houston and tore out houses and did some work that I uh, tell you it's hard, but we were agents of hope. And the man said, we've had uh, 45 new families coming into the church because of what we've done for them during the storm. I don't know, but I hear what I hear uh, Joseph saying. What the devil meant for bad, somehow God can turn for good. Are you listening to me? He's looking at his brothers. They sold him into slavery. They did not treat him right. They were mistreated mistreating him he didn't get all angry he said but what the devil meant for bad I believe the Lord can turn for my good he was in Egypt to use his position and resources to prepare a place of covenant to, uh, a place for the covenant people excuse me in the time of famine and that place was Goshen the people of Egypt they didn't want to go to Goshen Goshen wasn't their kind of place they said we're not farmers and we are not shepherds we're not going to Goshen that's wasteland, but God had it prepared for the people of God. Are you hearing me? Some of you today are in a very hostile environment at your workplace. You're in a hostile environment in this world. You're in a hostile environment even with your family. But I'm going to tell you something. You might be in a place of famine today, but I believe that God is going to use your position and resources to be a mighty blessing to others in these perilous times what the devil meant for bad he's tried to hold you down he's tried to mess you up he's tried to make your family dysfunctional he's tried to get you bound but I'm going to tell you what the devil meant for bad God is turning for good in these last days listen to this about Goshen again it was an extreme uh, northeast corner of Egypt but it was different than the rest of Egypt. That's what you need to hear. What I'm talking about, the blessing of God on your life, is different than the blessing that the world has. It's a place, Goshen was a place, where the Israelites could still follow the ways of the Lord and not mix with the Egyptians as long as they lived in that place called Goshen. 
The idolatry and lifestyles of the Egyptians would have no influence over them as long as they stayed in their place. So Goshen was a good place to wait until they returned to the land of Canaan. And then we get on. We find that God had spoke to Jacob and said, uh, you know, I, I want to tell you what's coming. I, I want you to know that uh, uh, something's coming for you. It's not going to be this way. He told him, God told Jacob, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. And he'd not only be with them, but he said, I'm going to bring you out as well. Now, in Genesis 46, 3 and 4, it says, And Joseph will lay hands upon thine eyes. Your son is going to lay hands on your eyes. And when Joseph would lay his hands on his father's eyes, it would make the future become very clear. It imparted a revelation of God's provision for the presence. I don't know, but I feel that God is going to lay his hand upon some of your eyes, not so you can see across the room, but you can see that God has a plan for your life and God has a purpose for your life and God wants to use you to be more than just an average old Joe but he's got something people are going to come to you because you are an agent of hope in these days somebody say amen the word that he got was somewhere in Egypt God would protect and provide for his people until they would possess their inheritance see my prayer today is that the future becomes clear to you. That you can see a revelation of God's provision for you. That no matter what you're going through right now, you might have a lousy bank account. You might have a lousy job. You might think that they're going to close down my plant. It's not going to get any better. But I want you to get a revelation that he is Jehovah Jireh, your provider today. Ephesians 1.18 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Folks, I don't know about you but my mom and dad aren't leaving me much on this earth that won't have to go to the garbage uh, but I'm going to tell you something I got an inheritance from my father God are you understanding me I got an inheritance because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary see I believe the Lord is showing us and giving us supernatural assurance that even when we encounter difficulties and rough times that he will never abandon us to our surroundings I think the word of God says it like this he will never leave us nor forsake us I believe the word says it like this that I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread he will not desert us in the days that we are living in today we could say that we are facing spiritual financial mental and emotional Egypt look around it doesn't look that well but if you watch the news and look around we're facing peril and danger our Culture is depraved, and now we exceed the immorality of Sodom. We can live by fear, or we can live by faith. The choice is ours. We can be led by the Spirit, or we can be led by our flesh. But the promise is that God will sustain and support His people through difficult times. Jacob and his children were supremely blessed in that place called Goshen, and in a country that was antagonistic to everything they believe. They came out by a miracle and left with great wealth and riches. I believe that's a type of the church leaving this world. I don't know, but I think my Jesus is coming soon. I look around and everything that's happening, I can look up my redemption draws nigh and I know the Word of God says that we're not leaving here uh, defeated. We're not leaving here depressed. We're not leaving here beaten down, but He's coming after a church without spot or wrinkle a victorious church for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words I'm telling you today my Jesus is coming soon and I'm not leaving here defeated I'm not leaving here you know, let's have a forfeit, you know, and we made it in. But I'm going to tell you, we are leaving as overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. We live in a world where lots of stuff is going on in the last days and the last time. 
We know that racism has increased. We know that hatred is rampant. We know there's division on every hand. We know that financial projections are negative. Morality has disappeared, but bad times and bad news does not negate the Word of God. Are you understanding me? Bad news and bad times does not negate the Word of God. My God does not depend on what the Democrats do. My God does not depend on what the Republicans do. My God does not depend on what the Supreme Court decides. My God is not depending on what the European Union does. His Word is true, unfailing, unwavering, uncompromising. It will not return void, but it shall prosper. Do you realize that my God still has a barrel of meal that cannot be emptied, a cruise of oil that will not fail? He can still put a coin in a fish's mouth. He can multiply the lunch to feed the multitude. He can command ravens to feed the prophet. And when the brook dries up, he already has another plan of action to provide. How many know he's our provider? Isaac will not be the last one. Are you hearing me? Isaac will not be the last of God's servant to reap a hundredfold in the year of famine. I don't know, but I think uh, there's somebody here today that it's about time for a hundredfold. Are you understanding me? I don't know what you've been receiving, but I I got greater things to do. I don't want to just have a a few, but I want to add a zero onto every crusade that I have. I want to see if there's 40,000, let's have 400,000. If there's 25,000, let's have 250,000. I don't know, but I think it's time that we reap a harvest in the middle of famine. Listen, if you will keep in covenant with God, you know what He is capable of and what He will do if you'll keep in covenant with God. He made a covenant with us. We need to keep a covenant with Him. We know Jesus is preparing a place for us in heaven, but I believe that we should understand that until our assignment is finished, he has a place for us here on earth. To Jacob and his family, it was Goshen. To you and I, it is a place where he will sustain us in this cursed world. We can expect to grow and multiply like Jacob's family did in Goshen. We can can expect the same. When we seek first the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto us. We ought to know that there's a Goshen-like place in the book of Psalm. In Psalm 91, it says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty goes on to say he's my refuge my fortress my God in him will I trust it goes on to say that angels keep charge over us and no plague shall come nigh our dwelling there's deliverance today there's victory today because we are in the place of safety listen to me I'm about done here But the place God has for us is a place of safety, comfort, and prosperity, a safety zone. But we got to go back to Goshen. It means a place of drawing near. It means a place of drawing near. Our only hope in these last days, these last times, is to draw near to God. Sometimes we say, well, I'm too busy. Our only hope in this day is to draw near to God. When we draw near to Him, what does it say? He draws near to us. Many people are like the Israelites. They forget that this world is not their permanent home. Many Israelites became accustomed to Egypt. They became comfortable with Egypt and the condemned culture. I cannot afford to become comfortable in this world and get uh, get buddying up to this condemned culture. Just like them, we can become so comfortable with the spirit of the age that we forget who we are, that we're the children of God. We are called Christians because we are to be like Christ. We need to be careful not to leave the safety zone of a separated and sanctified life. Real quickly, it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. How do we separate ourselves from this world? We live in it. How do we separate ourselves? By staying close to God. 
although it's not in the same chapter, it's the next verse, it says this. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Listen to me. I'm a believer, the true believer, the child of God, the true Christian has got to keep a safe distance from the world. We are in it, but we are not of it. The Bible still says, neither give place to the devil. I got to watch how I live. There is a line, and I don't know where that line is, but there's a line between righteousness and unrighteousness, and I've got to be careful not to cross the line. Goshen is a place uh, where plagues cannot touch us, where the troubles of this world cannot invade us. It is where you prosper in perilous times. It's where you're blessed in spite of devastation and destruction around you. It's time that we leave Egypt or this world with all of its sinful pleasures and idolatry and warped concepts and dwell in that place that is near God. we got to draw near to Him. Stand up on your feet and lift up your hands and begin to praise Him. Come on. Come on. Somebody begin to glorify the Lord in this house. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on. Lift up your hands and glorify Him right now. Come on. Lift them up. I love you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for conviction in this place. Thank you for the Spirit of the Lord brings freedom and liberty. There's people here that are captives, Lord, by their life. There's people here that are bound by heroin, that they might be set free today in the name of Jesus. There are people here that are bound by alcohol. There are people here that are bound by thoughts in their mind. Let them be free in the name of Jesus. Let them come out from among this world, Lord. Let them know that this is a place of drawing near. I want you to look at me for a minute. In church, we call this area at the front of the church the altar. If you're old school, we call it the altar. The altar has always been a place where you draw near to God. We need to get in this altar more often. This isn't a place to stay away from. This is a place to come. It's a place of mercy. It's a place of grace. I thank God when I grew up, we had an altar. I don't know where I'd be without the altar. I got to to get close to God. Thanks so much for watching this podcast or if you're just listening to it, thanks so much for being part of our church service today. I know the Word is so rich and when we give attention to the Word, the Word comes in and does amazing things in our lives. You know, I feel in our church that recently we've just been like sitting on a powder keg of the Holy Spirit and it's just ready to blow. Man, I see lives changed every single week in our church and it's so exciting. I walk out of here sometimes and and it's like I've had a surreal experience of just seeing God move and do things that I only previously dreamed of. So I'm so glad that you're part of that today. And you know, the greatest decision you can ever make in life is to serve the Lord Jesus, to ask Him into your heart, to make Him the Lord of your life, to ask Him to take away all the sin, all the shame, and all the guilt. If you'd like to pray with me right now and receive Him into your heart, this can happen. You can pray right where you are, whether you're at home or you're at work or wherever you're listening to this. You can pray right now and ask the Lord into your life and He can do something that no other man can do. He can bring peace, He can bring salvation, He can bring healing. So if you're ready for that, just pray with me right now. Say these words, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin, that you wash away the guilt, that you wash away the shame. I accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life and help me to serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. And you can say amen where you are. I want to pray for you now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone watching. I ask that you bring healing. I ask that you bring deliverance. I ask that you bring peace of mind. Lord, for those struggling with family problems, Lord, I ask that you come in and speak peace to the storm that's going on in their lives right now. And Lord, we love you, we bless you, we thank you today for who you are. Thank you for the audience listening and watching today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
So follow us online, follow us on our social media pages. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, till next time, walk with the Lord, be blessed, grow in the word and go forward in him.